My mantra is really like, we can't leave the tech bros alone on this. Our ideas about technology that we think are normal are actually ideas that come from a very small and homogeneous group of people. Vast amounts of data at incredible speed. It took me two years to get from starting Coded Bias to my Sundance premiere. And for those two years, I could not speak to people at parties because I was too scared that they would ask me what I was doing and I couldn't explain my film. My crew is often just me and my brilliant director of photography, Steve Acevedo, who's my right hand in crime. And we do the work of an entire crew of the two of us. We shot on the Sony FS7 and a Blackmagic camera. My shooting ratios are remarkably low, I have to say. I maybe have done 25 interviews for the film. We shot in, I think, five countries, uh, China, South Africa, uh, the UK, and the US, and India. I got computer vision software that was supposed to track my face. It didn't work until I put on this white mask. I'm thinking, all right, what's going on here? Is it the lighting conditions? Is it the angle at which I'm looking at the camera? Or is there something more? That's when I started looking into issues of bias that can creep into technology. Why was Joy such a good focal point for this film? I think that Joy makes an amazing primary character because she's a bridge crosser. She both is an MIT media scientist and a brilliant data scientist and has really sound scientific method. But we also follow her to a black hair salon and we see her interact with Brooklyn residents who are trying to keep their landlord from installing facial recognition. And I think she has this rare ability to understand complex science, but also to connect it to communities that are marginalized. I think that's a rare skill. I think a lot of computer scientists are just like in the pixels of what they're doing and not really connecting to communities that could be harmed by these practices. Everybody has unconscious biases and people embed their own biases into technology. I was wondering if you could break down the data is destiny kind of theory. I don't think that my background is sort of a sci-fi fanatic prepared me for the realities of what AI is, what it can and cannot do, and how it's being used as this invisible gatekeeper of opportunity in our world. You know, we think about algorithms or AI as these like sort of future gazing technologies, but they're all based on data from the past. And a lot of times that data is written with bias, with systematic inequalities, and what happens is, is that we use that data to predict behavior in the future. And that means that sometimes we're encoding the same biases of the past and it becomes this sort of deterministic model. Racism is becoming mechanized. Systemic issues are only going to be hardwired into new technologies. What was the one revelation that probably shook you the most? There were so many revelations that shook me in the making of this film. But I think some of the things that were most alarming to me was the extent to which we are trusting these systems to be this invisible gatekeeper of opportunity. The fact that these systems now are sort of the first gatekeeper in who gets hired, what quality of healthcare someone has, even how long a prison sentence someone may serve. And what was just startling to me was that these systems that we're putting our blind faith in haven't been vetted for racial bias or for gender bias. And more broadly, they haven't been vetted to make sure they won't hurt people. It's sort of like the automobile industry without a car seat for your baby or um, seatbelt laws. It's like getting a pharmaceutical product with no counterindications, no usage on the label. It's like a wild, wild west. These systems haven't even been vetted for some standard of accuracy. And I think only in the making of this film and getting this education from the brilliant and badass cast of my film, that I started to get some basic literacy and started to realize 
and be able to discern what is actually sound data science and what is bogus baloney pseudoscience being sold to us like a bag of tricks. And it's just this invisible hand of power. Every day we are all being scored. Who gets hired? Who gets housing? I am making predictions for your life right now. I'm curious what has the reaction been in big tech in Silicon Valley and all over the world to this film? I think all except for Amazon, I think I spoke too much about them in the film for them to host a screening, but um, almost every other major tech company has hosted a screening of Coded Bias which to me, I never anticipated ever. (laughs) And I think that is hopeful. That being said, I have noticed this pattern of these tech companies dismissing and discrediting independent researchers like Joy Bellamwini, like Dr. Timnit Gebru of Google, who was recently fired for her views on ethics and AI. And I, and I see that there is often a backlash before there's a groundswell of our voices pushing big tech um, to do the right thing. I think that big tech is not our enemy. I've met lots of conscientious, well-meaning, brilliant people who work inside these companies and want to do the right thing and want to make change. But my mantra is really like, we can't leave the tech bros alone on this. They need to hear and feel the groundswell from the public. And I think what's noteworthy since the film premiered at Sundance is that three of the largest tech companies in the world have changed their policies around selling facial recognition. IBM got out of the game, disrupted their entire business model, closed up shop, they're done with facial recognition. Microsoft stopped selling to police and Amazon said they would put a take a one-year pause of which we're good for two more months. That change happened in June, 2020, when the research had been out for a year and a half, my film had been out for six months. And that timing is important because that's when we had the largest movement for civil rights and equality around the unjust murder of George Floyd and people of all colors standing together in the streets against systematic racism. And I think that people were drawing the connections because of those three things between racially biased technology in the hands of law enforcement with no one we elected giving any oversight and the communities um, that could be the most harmed. And I really see algorithmic justice as the unfinished work of the civil rights movement and that it will happen in quite the same way with um, our voices being heard. The people who own the code deploy it on other people and there is no accountability. We are socially controlled in a way that we don't see. Coded bias kind of ends optimistically. Was it hard? Do you feel like the movie is optimistic? And do you feel like that was your intent? I think the film is both terrifying and optimistic, maybe alternating. I think that I make documentaries partly because they remind me that every day people change the world and all the superheroes among us are not always wearing capes. And I've really seen that in the making of the film. I think it gives me an enormous hope that that everyday people can and do change the world when we care enough to do that work. Technology that analyzes faces could be biased, but the company is pushing it anyway. What demographic is it most effective on? White men. How has making this film changed your day to day? Do you put like a hider over your camera or anything like that? <laughs> I, I definitely have I have I definitely have tape over my camera and I, I pay a little bit more attention to privacy settings. But I think honestly, we can't opt out of these systems. I mean, this is the only way we can be together today. I'm a huge tech head. I made the film because I love technology. I just want there to be some set of guidelines and safety around these systems. So if anything, You know, I think people, when they ask the question, are hoping for some like secret voodoo set of privacy settings that I can give you to to do that. And Electronic Frontier Foundation has a few suggestions. I think, honestly, it's made me participate in my democracy more. We really need systematic change. And that is kind of how it's changed my perspective is supporting these great organizations and participating more in letting my voice be heard to policymakers. It's going to take people coming together, driving for justice in this age of automation. 